everyone welcome back to the engineered angler i'm out here getting some underwater footage of some lures i'm going to use in this master class on how crankbaits actually work what makes them wobble what makes them wiggle what makes them dive this is part two in the master class so if you haven't seen the first one you should probably go check it out i'll put a link in the description so for us to really get in depth in what's going on with these things we got to go back to the shop and to the dry erase board so stick around So if this is your first time to the channel, my name's Franco, I'm a professional engineer, a lure designer and lure maker, and an avid fisherman. And I make these videos so that I can show you how I add a little bit of physics and engineering to the art of lure making. And if you came to the channel really wanting to see a crankbait being made, well I'll put a link here and you can find quite a few crankbait builds in my playlist on my channel. But for those of you who are just absolute lure nerds like me, let's go ahead and get to it and talk about crankbait design fundamentals. All right, let's get right back to it. Uh, if you'll recall from the Masterclass 1, I went through what forces are acting on the lure sort of in a simple model. And if you haven't seen that, I really do recommend you go uh, check it out because this information sort of builds on itself. You have to sort of build the knowledge a little block at a time and then be able to sort of assemble it when you're going to um, either design a lure or you're actually looking at lures to buy. And what I had explained was that the two major forces acting on the lure, the water flowing across it and the line being pulled by you have component forces that are both horizontal and vertical. And basically, as long as the vertical component of the force on the lure is larger than the vertical component of the force from you pulling on the line, the lure will continue to dive. When the line angle becomes really steep, that vertical component grows larger than this vertical component pointing down and the lure starts to come up. So that's basically what we covered on the last one. And I wanted to cover that even though that's more of a dive depth issue. There's really no way to sort of completely separate all the components of what's going on with a lure. Everything that acts on it to make it wobble or roll also acts on it to make it dive. So we're gonna learn this stuff piece by piece, but in the end, you'll be able to sort of meld all that information together and make better decisions, either buying lures or uh, designing your own. But that said, we're going to focus on what makes a lure wobble. At least that's what I call it. What makes that amplitude increase and what makes it shrink down? And how are you going to be able to control that with your design? And really, what are the limits? So the video after the first master class that I did, I actually made this lure. And I'll put a link to that uh, video above me. And it's a copy of this lure, which is uh, just a classic seven inch crankbait. And when I made it, I also, I showed you what it looked like underwater. And I told you in that video that I would talk about how I made this one have a bigger head movement than the original, even though I copied the bib as exactly as I could. And I even got the angle almost exactly the same. So let's go ahead to the underwater shots and I'll show you the difference. Here's the original lure. And you can see it's got lots of roll. Those googly eyes are rolling all over the place. And it's got a decent action. When you look at it from above, it really doesn't look this aggressive. Here's my copy of the lure. And you can see it has just as big a roll and a lot more head shake. You can really tell by watching the tail. It moves a lot. And here they are side by side in slow motion. The left one is the original. If you take a close look, you can really see how wide the wobble is on the one on the right. It just moves a lot more. And the way I was able to achieve a bigger head shake and not just the roll was by moving my tie on eye. That really is the key to this. It's the location of that tie on eye. It gets a little more complicated because it's a little difficult to judge sometimes on lures where maybe you have the tie and eye 
actually down on the bib. Or like these, the tie-on eye locations appear to be very similar, almost the same. But if you look at the one on the bottom, you'll notice that that tie-on eye actually curls downward a little bit and you'll see that it actually overhangs the bib farther than the original one. And that's the key to the bigger head movement. As you pull that tie-on eye closer to what I like to call the center of impact, which really is the center of drag of the entire lure body and bib. Let me show you. Let me use my sort of monstrosity here. Somebody suggested that I call this Krankenstein. <laughs> And I love that, it makes me laugh every time I think about it. It is kind of monstrous, but I designed it to be versatile enough that I can actually use it as a hand puppet, I guess, I don't know. But if you look at a lure, it'll have a fixed angle of the bib, right? We're gonna call that our design angle. And the reason that's important, it's because the angle that this thing is actually gonna swim at is not gonna be your design angle. When you pull on that crankbait, it'll rock downward and establish a dynamic angle. And that dynamic angle once it's set, changes the way the water impacts the body. So if the lure were to be swimming directly into the flow of the water without tilting, you see that plane, that those surface areas are what will be impacted by the water. And the center of drag is going to be somewhere in the center of that area there, that cross section. And just eyeballing it, it'll be down on the lip somewhere because the body isn't as large as the lip. As this thing rotates into its dynamic angle of attack, you see a lot more of the body is exposed to the water flow. And so the center drag actually begins to move upward. That affects both the action and the depth of dive. So the key here is to try to minimize the rotation into a very different dynamic angle. And you can do that by shaping the body, making it longer, making it flatter on top, and by placing your tie on eye closer to the original center of drag. I can move my tie on eye down closer to the center of drag. This creates a connection that is less stable for, for lack of a better word. And the way I like to think about it, when you're pulling on this lure with line and the water is pushing back on it, imagine that where this red arrow is, is actually where uh, the center of drag is. And if you've got these two forces separated by some distance, it creates a little bit of stability. Imagine if you're holding on to something from two distant points, you have a lot more uh, leverage or stability on it. If those two points you're holding at are very close, it becomes very difficult to have a, any kind of authority over this. And so the movement it has more freedom. At least that's the way I look at it. That's not exactly what's going on as far as hydrodynamics are concerned, but it's a good way to think about it. The closer those two points are, your point of pull and the point of drag from the water, the closer they are together, the more free that body is to move. The farther they are apart, the more restrained it is. So to demonstrate that, I made this little lure. And if you look very closely, it has multiple tie-on eyes made from a single sheet of real thin plastic with a lot of little holes drilled in it. And by changing the location that you use to pull the lure, you change the action. Let me show you, here's some water shots. Let's start off hooking up to a low spot, somewhere where we'll get a nice wide action. And you can see it certainly does that. That tail is all over the place. Here in slow motion, you can see how big of a movement it has. Now let's move the tie on just a little bit higher, somewhere near the peak. And it's immediately obvious that the action's been reduced. Even at a higher speed, you can see that the wiggle is really tight. It's a low amplitude wiggle. And in slow motion, you can really see the difference. Now let's move it to the extreme top end. And again, a dramatic reduction in action. It's barely wiggling. And in fact, I had a hard time keeping it behind me because the turbulence from the back of the boat was just knocking it around. What a difference.
So the final behavior I want to sort of uh, explain, I hope I can explain it, is porpoising or bobbing. It depends on what you call it. It's when the lure, instead of wagging back and forth, actually porpoises up and down and has very little wag. Now I ran into that with this lure that I made on the lathe and it was an experimental shape for me. And I recommend you watch this video because when I first try it, it actually has a really bad porpoising action. And I really was scratching my head to figure out why it was doing that. And what I found was that the underside of the bib was very round at that time and I flattened it out. And why that makes a difference is because as I covered on the first uh, masterclass video, what makes the lure actually wobble are vortices that are created behind the bib and then pop off as little balls of energy and cause the lure, ouch, and cause the lure to have an equal and opposite reaction to that loss of a little sort of energy ball. But if the lure is too hydrodynamic, if the flow of the water is too smooth coming off, you won't get that energy and you end up with a bob. So I figured that if a really round bodied lure had the tendency or the possibility of having the porpoising problem, then my little jelly bean crankbait, which has a tremendous action and really is a very good lure, should have a tendency to do that at some tie on eye location. So what I did was I made this one and you can see I put in multiple tie-on eyes. They're just little metal loops and I experimented connecting to each one and finally got it to actually porpoise. Let me show you. This is such a strange action. It's hard to believe a lure will actually do it. It looks like a hobby horse, but it's definitely obvious in slow motion. So you can see even porpoising can be remedied with the tie on eye location adjustment. Sometimes down closer to the bib, sometimes back and away from the bib. Before I end this video, I just want to show you one more thing. This lure, I made this lure, oh, I don't know, probably three years ago. And it's an absolute dud. I, I, I'm trying to figure out whether to use it as a door handle or door knocker, I don't know. It really is useless as a lure. And I did uh, experiment with it, uh, with weight and the tie on eye location, and I never really got it to work very well. And I tell you all this because everybody can make a dud. Even if you've been making lures for a long time and have a good understanding of the design and what makes a good design, you can still make a dud. And I keep this around to, uh, I guess, keep me humble. All right, everybody, that's it for this masterclass. The next masterclass, we're gonna probably get into dive depth and uh, weight and balance. So until that one, hopefully we'll go back to making lures and we'll give everyone who isn't a complete lure nerd a break. All right, I'll see you guys next Friday on the next video.